Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Pentecost service. The Lord be with you. And this morning, our readings are from the book of Numbers, chapter 11, verses 24 to 30, Psalm 104, verses 26 to 36, from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 to 21, and then from the the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 to 23. Let's pray our colleague for today. Almighty God, with wind from heaven and tongues of flame, you poured out your Spirit on the disciples, set our hearts on fire with joy and power, and sent us out as witnesses to the wonder of your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. On Monday morning, as I sat down to prepare for the sermon, I had a picture of a huge wooden bow of a, of a ship plowing through turbulent, uncharted waters, I was reminded of Noah's Ark. We've been kept safe inside a huge ark, the ark of God's love and protection. And though we may not feel like it, in fact, there's been a lot of grumbling and grousing about being kept in lockdown. We have, in fact, been kept safe. After the flood, the mountaintops became visible after 73 days. And a new age began with eight people. Eight is the biblical number for a new beginning. We are also entering into a new beginning, a time of stepping out of safety and into our day-to-day -day lives. Noah sent a raven symbolizing the law, but it didn't come back. There was no assurance that the water had subsided, just as the law can't give us an assurance of forgiveness. I pray that as we get back to our lives, this time of lockdown will have forever shaped and changed us, helped us to see what is important, softened our attitudes towards others, that we will not be like that raven who is only concerned for itself, its new life, its new beginning, with no care or concern for others. Noah then sent a dove and the dove came back with an olive branch, the symbol of peace, symbolizing the gospel of grace that is given to us by the Holy Spirit. Every time the, the dove of God comes, it brings a fresh olive branch, fresh oil for the sons and daughters of God. For generations, the dove seeking a place to rest flew over Abraham, Moses, the prophets and kings, unable to find a resting place. In the Old Testament reading set for today, we read about Moses sharing the Holy Spirit with 70 elders. Eldad and Medad weren't with them when this happened, but they were also filled with the Holy Spirit, reminding us that God can and does work through whom he chooses. In the Old Testament, the Spirit was always given at certain times to certain people to do God's will. But at last, at the River Jordan, the dove came from the open heaven and rested on the perfect man, Jesus, the Son of God. Noah waited over six weeks in the ark at the top of Mount Ararat until the waters completely receded and the ground was dry. This took great discipline. No one likes to wait. But God's timing is always perfect. This doesn't mean we will not face difficult times. We will. But we will do it with the knowledge that the precautions have and that are being taken, that the medical profession and scientists are constantly at work to find answers and, to, and solutions to this pandemic, that they are working on vaccines. But we also need to remember that we have a part to play. Jesus told his disciples to wait until they'd received the Holy Spirit. We need to learn to wait 
and listen to the Holy Spirit as he leads and guides us. Just as we need to take physical precautions like washing our hands, sanitizing, wearing masks and taking our temperatures, we need to take spiritual precautions as well. Don't let's become like Pilate, washing our hands and turning away from the reality that for many people, water is a luxury they do not possess. Let's not hide behind our masks that shield us from the reality of the suffering, the hungry, the destitute, the lonely. Let's not become lukewarm in our faith. We know what God says about that. Now to the reading, the gospel reading that is set for today. The same night after Mary Magdalene said she had seen and talked to the risen Jesus, the disciples were hiding behind closed doors, probably still reeling from his death, probably ashamed that they hadn't been there when he needed them the most. And now this woman, a woman, was making the most incredible claim. Was it possible? Could it be true that Jesus was resurrected, that there was a new beginning? Hope began to rise, and suddenly he was there in their midst, and his first words were, Peace be with you. Jesus would probably have used the greeting Shalom, often translated as, as peace, but Shalom has a much richer meeting, meaning in its most basic form, it's often described as complete or whole. In its fuller meaning, shalom refers to a state of a complex ecosystem with all its parts operating in perfect alignment with each other. But shalom exists in a fragile balance and many things are able to threaten it. In the Hebrew tradition, the idea of shalom is more than just individual well-being. It brings to mind the idea of a justly ordered society at peace with itself. We find this idea summed up throughout the Bible, and we find it especially in the Mishpat. Mishpat is about taking steps to stand up for the vulnerable and actively working at challenging and changing unjust social structures. It is about a radical, selfless way of life. For biblical writers, justice was about restoring the image of God in all humanity. It was what the people of God in the Old Testament were supposed to be about. Instead, the reality of injustice seemed an inescapable one. Just like them, we are all trapped in its tentacles. We are influenced by it. We all play a part in it, passively, actively, even unintentionally, when we refuse to see each person as being made in the image of God, beloved sons and daughters of God. However, God had a plan to counter this problem. Jesus the Prince of Shalom, who would right all wrongs. In Jesus, God's gift of himself is fulfilled as he shares in our humanity and demonstrates what a life of Mishpat and Shalom could look like. In Jesus, God offers to a broken and often brutalized world the ultimate invitation to live as one, in Jesus, disfigured creation is restored to wholeness. For the disciples and the early Christians, this gift of Jesus and the Holy Spirit was understood not merely as a privilege to be enjoyed for themselves, but instead they received it as an invitation to live and strive for the common good. For them it was a clear sign of the transformative and irresistible power of God that compelled any open and willing heart to live and act in radically new ways. Isn't that what Peter said on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out? 
Before, at the Tower of Babel, humans were divided by languages. Now, in Christ, the language of the Spirit unified all mankind in him. Jews, Gentiles, sons, daughters, young men, old men, servants, everyone who called on the name of the Lord. So we have a new beginning, the beginning of the church. When Jesus commissioned the disciples, he gave them a mission. We often talk about the mission statement of churches. Our mission statement at St. Albans is we seek to be a God-directed, Christ-centered and Spirit-empowered church. Parker Palmer said in his book, In the Company of Strangers, the mission of the church is not to enlarge its membership, not to bring outsiders to accept its terms, but simply to love the world in every possible way, to love the world as God did and does. William Sloan Coffin said, as I see it, the primary task these days is to try and think straight. We can't think straight with a heart full of fear, for fear seeks safety, not truth. If your heart is a stone, you can't have decent thoughts, either about a personal relationship or about international ones. A heart full of love, on the other hand, has a freeing effect on all. Father God, pour out your love into our hearts. Love that drives away fear. The kind of love that cannot be held back by a tomb, kept out by locked doors. Maya Angelou describes love beautifully when she writes. Love recognizes no barriers, it jumps hurdles, it leaps fences, it penetrates walls to arrive at its destination full of hope. The disciples, ordinary men with faults and failings, became effective, powerful and useful in the hands of God. They became instrument vessels and channels through which the Holy Spirit worked. God is the same today as he was yesterday and will be tomorrow. He will always be the God of signs and wonders and his plans to use power, sorry, and his plans to use his power for the highest good of all creation will never change. As we learn that God requires us to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with him. His plan is still to fill us with his Holy Spirit so that the Holy Spirit can transform us and transform our communities, our societies, our families, our workplaces, our friends, our schools, our universities, and further and further and further as the Spirit leads. The Holy Spirit, sorry, the Apostle Paul helps us to understand that we've all been given at least one spiritual gift. We need to embark on a journey of adventure and discovery to find out what that gift is and to use it for the common good to build up God's church. Every time the, God of, the dove of God comes, he brings a fresh olive branch, fresh oil for the anointing of the sons and daughters of God. And he does that again this morning as he pours out his spirit on each one of us. Let's pray. Father God, we ask for a fresh stirring and filling of your Holy Spirit. We know that apart from your spirit, we can't believe the gospel and love Jesus the way we want to. So Father, by the power that raised him from the dead, open the eyes of our hearts to see more of Jesus. Dazzle us with his delights, buckle our knees with his beauty and put us face down on the ground for a new awareness of his glory and grace. Grant us jaw drop in wonder and awe in response to Jesus' majesty 
and the mercy of Jesus and the perfection and completion of his work for us. Grant us power with all your children to know the height, the depth, the width, the breadth of Jesus' love. A love that surpasses knowledge. The only love that is better than life. The only love that is enough. You've poured out his love into our hearts before. Do it again and again and again, Father. May the love of Jesus be the most compelling and propelling force in our lives, turning our whining into worship, our timidity into fearless faith, small dreams into a kingdom vision, our hesitation to risk much into a life of gospel adventure. By the power of the Holy Spirit, restore to us the joy of your incomparable salvation. Renew our love for the beauty and freedom of holiness and intensify our awareness and excitement about the occupied throne of heaven. Indeed, Father, you are working all things for your glory and for our good. And you are working all things together after the counsel of your will. And you are summing up all things in Christ. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Hallelujah. Jesus, what a salvation you have won for us. Father God, we pray all these things in and through the precious name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please remember that today is a national day of prayer for our country. So here are some thoughts for prayers. Pray for all those who are infected by the coronavirus. Pray for healing for them. Pray for all families who have lost loved ones. Pray for God's comfort, healing and peace in their lives. Pray for all frontline workers, that they will be protected, they will have all the necessary equipment to keep them safe. Thank God for them. Thank God for the work that they do. Pray for all medical personnel, for nurses, doctors, scientists, epidemiologists working to combat this virus. Pray for their safety. Thank God for them. Pray for the reopening of our schools. Pray for the safety of teachers and pupils. Pray for churches as we look at ways of opening, holding services while keeping all safe. Pray for the elderly and the frail, those with comorbidities as they cope with this virus. Help those who deal with these people to make wise decisions about their safety. Pray for businesses that are struggling financially, that they would be able to receive the help they need. Help us to help the needy, the starving, the lonely, the afraid. Help us to be the hands, the feet, the ears, the eyes, but most of all the heart of Jesus Christ to those in need.
us and watch over us. May the Lord make his face shine on us and be gracious to us. May the Lord look kindly on us and give us his peace. Amen.